What a difference a week can make. Jesus came in to Jerusalem in what is called the triumphal entry with thousands welcoming him. And by the end of the week, he was crucified on the cross for your sin and for my sin. Last week, we looked at the sacrifice of Christ. It was the darkest Friday, the worst Friday in Earth's history. And it was the, ble- the best Friday in Earth's history. But when you spend time reflecting on the death and sacrifice of Christ. There's something that happens inside of you to realize just how much God loves you and how horrible sin is. Death, despair, and darkness as he died on the cross and cried out, it is finished. His work and his task was done. But thank God the story doesn't stop there. The story doesn't stop in the darkness. The story continues. So this morning, we will go from the point of darkness and despair to a point of light and hope. There's something about death that just the word sends a chill into our hearts and somehow into our spine. It seems so permanent. It seemed so dark. I stood beside the grave of many people. And usually it is the filling of the grave that kind of marks the end of the service. And people people leave. It wasn't that way in the time of Jesus. For you see, in the time of Jesus... It was customary that the body would be taken to the tomb or the cave, placed in the tomb or cave, and the stone would be rolled in front of the tomb or the cave to seal the person in. Now you have to realize that it was different than what we're accustomed to. For you see that gravestone was about a meter across or about three feet across several inches thick, and in front of the grave, they would, uh, that round stone typically, they would make a track. And the track would be, uh, the, the stone itself would be rolled up, uphill to the front of the cave. And then adjacent to the opening, a, a trench would be cut so that the stone would be rolled up and then it would roll downhill into the groove and it would seal the tomb, or the grave, or the cave, as the case might be. Now you must realize that that disc, granite disc or stone, would often weigh about 2,700 pounds. Not a light task. Something that would take two or three men to do. That stone would symbolize completion, that the resting place was secure. In John chapter, in, in the story of John, we are going to look at Jesus' final resting place in just a moment. But I want to go back to set, uh, to set the story and anchor it in John chapter 11. 
a story that we've looked at in great detail previously, but just to pick up a couple of points. John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. We find there the story of Lazarus. And I find there a stone that I label the Lazarus stone. For you see the story of Lazarus, and the Lazarus stone is a stone of promise, a promise of life. For it tells the story that Jesus is not only concerned about those who are alive, but also concerned about the one that is passed on. Jesus proclaimed in John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, he said, I am the resurrection and what? And the life. I am the resurrection and the life. The Lazarus stone is a stone of compassion. For you find, you find that uh, Jesus recognized the pain and suffering of the friends of Lazarus. And in John chapter 11, verse 35, it simply says, As he came to them, he wept. And verse 36 says, Behold, how he loved them. He was with them in their pain and in their difficulties. There is no place of death and despair and darkness that you will ever be alone. Because Jesus is right there with you. It doesn't matter what stones there are in your life. There are difficulties and complexities that we face that sometimes we feel we have to face it alone. When they came to the tomb of Lazarus, he had been dead four days. That's a day longer than Jesus, isn't it? It wasn't until I read the story that I nuanced a little bit of the difference. Perhaps he left him in the grave for four days so he would not be confused. For it was, it was told that Jesus would be three days in the tomb. One extra day for him. He was well deceased. So much so that when they rolled, Jesus came. <laughs> it's interesting to me. Jesus came to that tomb. And all he needed to do was speak. And that, and that, that, that gray stone would have rolled back away from that. All he would have needed to do was speak. No, no. He said, remove, remove that stone. And as they removed that stone, the stench came forth from that tomb. Take away the stone, Jesus said. God specializes in the seemingly impossible. God specializes in the difficulties in life. God specializes in the darkness, in the despair, where there is no hope. God specializes because He weeps when we weep. He shows compassion when it seems so hopeless and simply proclaims the, claim, proclaims the words, Lazarus, come forth! And out of the darkness of that tomb, Lazarus, his body takes life again. He stands up, draped in, in the clothes that he wrapped him in as they placed him in the grave. He that is dead comes forth. And Jesus said, Loose him and let him go. Let him go and let him proclaim the goodness of God, that God brings life no matter what binds you. God brings life no matter how hopeless or impossible it seems. No sin, not the past, not others, not circumstances, not indifference. Nothing binds you from the love of Christ. Nothing places you too far out of his reach. And the stone of Lazarus is a stone that marks that God wants us. And His compassion is with us. And He simply says, come forth. And that 
which was dead lives. And many believed on what he did. The Lazarus stone is a stone of promise that this life, although it is transitory, this life, although it is limited, that God cares for the living and He cares for those who go to sleep in the hope of eternal life. That one day soon He will call forth those who have laid down the burdens of life. There is no stone in life too big to separate us from the words and the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know how it is in your life, friends. What a difference a week makes. What a difference three or four days makes. What a difference a few hours can make. One day we're so connected with Christ, we're on top of the world, and we feel that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And that stone, that boulder of difficulty and despair rolls in and Satan rolls it across our path and we can't see through it. And it's immovable. It's impossible. We can't do anything about it. I am so glad that we serve a God that specializes in the impossible. How about you, friends? The second stone that I find, the first stone was the introductory stone. It was just the little stone in history. But how great it would have been to be there and watch that transpire. But the next stone in John, in the story, uh, in the Gospel of John, is the stone of resurrection found in John chapter 20. The second stone is the gravestone And the stone of power, the stone of holiness, righteousness over evil. Jesus had died on the cross. And even there on the cross, the record showed that he saved three people. While he was dying on the cross, the thief on one side rejected him. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross and save all of us. We're being crucified for the deeds that we did. The other thief on the other side simply turned to him and said, Remember me when you come in paradise and found forgiveness. There were three that day that received Jesus Christ. Who were the other two? Quickly. Oh, you got the centurion. That's right. The centurion cried out, Who else? Who carried his cross? Simon. Desire of Asia says, there were three that received salvation. There were three, Simon who carried his cross. And after the crucifixion, somebody cried out, truly this is the Son of God. You would look around and anticipate it would be one of his disciples. Somebody who had walked with him and talked with him, but his disciples were not Not to be found, they fled in fear. Only the women knelt at the foot of the cross, worshiping him. Who said, truly this is the Son of God? It was the Roman centurion. Probably the one who pierced his side and yielded his life to Jesus. All eyes looked around, the disciples nowhere to be found. The the Roman centurion seeing with what peace that Jesus had, what, uh, what relationship he had with his heavenly Father, gave his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. His, broken bo- his unbroken body was taken from the cross and now rests in the tomb over the Sabbath hours. Stillness. Life is gone. In the darkness of the night, as the tomb was sealed with a stone, as a hundred Roman centurion soldiers were placed in front of the tomb, as they had taken that tomb and stretched ropes and sealed those ropes on each side of the stone, so that no one could enter that tomb, silence and darkness of the night brought about hopelessness 
and despair. The tomb surrounded by the centurions. And Desire of Ages says, by a host of evil angels. And records that for a moment, Satan felt that he had gained the victory, the eternal victory over the Son of God. He was sure that he had conquered Christ. For a moment, darkness prevailed. For a moment, hope gave way to hopelessness. Darkness and death. The stone could no, could no more hold back Jesus. It was about the evening, sundown time, that Jesus, darkness, surrounded and shrouded the cross. It's recorded that darkness, as Jesus gave up his life for our sins, darkness enshrouded the cross. Now in the middle of the night, as darkness enshrouds the tomb of Jesus. The earth quakes a second time. The boulders, the rocks start to tremble and move back and forth. It's an F14 F earthquake? No, it's not F14. What's the earthquake magnitude? It's an earthquake of 14, magnitude of 14. Something that California has never experienced. A hundred on the scale, if you please. In the darkness of the night, an angel descends from heaven, moves the stone. The darkness gives way to light from heaven. Do you know who that angel is? Hmm. Desire of Ages happens to tell us there is a certain sense of poetic justice. It is Satan who thinks for a moment that at the cross he has defeated Christ and he will be ruler of the universe. Desire of Ages says it is the one in heaven who took Satan's place as the highest angel in heaven comes down, is sent down from heaven to move the stone away. Did Jesus need any help? He, could have, he didn't need that stone rolled away. He could have gone right through. There was nothing that could contain Jesus in that grave. And praise God, Jesus comes forth. Jesus comes forth. Darkness gives way to light. Mortal gives way to immortal. Sinfulness gives way to holiness. Hopelessness gives way to hope. And Jesus lives. It's quiet at the tomb. It's quiet at the tomb, and it's still dark as some of the ladies make their way to gather at the tomb. Some of the ladies make their way to gather at the tomb to prepare the body, bringing spices and ointments. They make their way. They make their way to the tomb. The soldiers don't know what to do. They see, they see the, the stone rolled back. They've looked into the tomb. And they don't know what they're going to do because of the death penalty. If you fall asleep as a Roman soldier, it would, be, uh, it would be a death sentence for you. Pilate had placed them there. There was silence as the ladies made their way to prepare. On the way they said, we don't have anybody to remove we remove the tombstone so that we can have access to prepare the bodies. 
And as they saw the tomb was empty, they ran back and got some of the disciples. They made their way to the tomb. And you know the story as well as I do. As they made their way to the tomb, they went into the tomb and they found the tomb empty with two angels, one at the, the head and one at where the foot would be of the person there. And the tomb was empty. Thank God the tomb was empty. Thank God that Jesus wasn't there. The resurrection stone is a stone that, that tells us evil will never prevail over holiness. When you struggle, when you struggle, go to the empty tomb. When you struggle with emptiness in your life, realize that Christ is risen. He's right there. Realize you're not facing it alone. And so they go in search. And Mary is searching for Christ. She sees what appears to be the gardener in our, in our text today. Where have you laid his body? And immediately, when he said Mary, she recognized his voice. All it took was one word. Isn't that the way it, isn't that the way it works? When you love somebody, you can recognize their voice? She had been so long with Jesus. And she said, Rabboni, that is to say, Master. And she saw the risen Christ. Jesus said, don't touch me yet, for I have not ascended unto my Father. The stone of compassion with Lazarus. The stone of resurrection of mortal giving way to immortality. The stone of resurrection is a stone of power. The stone of resurrection is a conquering stone. The stone of resurrection is a stone that replaces wickedness with holiness. The stone of resurrection tells us that nothing is impossible. There's no place that we can go. There's no place that we can find ourselves, but that God isn't present there if we will look up and look to the resurrected Christ. Do you believe that, friends? Do you believe that, friends? What a difference a week can make, but what a difference a day can make. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that that day wasn't very long. I'm so glad it wasn't a week in coming. But we have the presence of Christ in our life. A presence from the marker of stones being a symbol of the tomb and the transition. I want to look at two more stones in the Bible and just touch on them. Because they go from being an inanimate object to a living object. You see, Christ was called the rock of our salvation. The stone of our life, if you please. And so when he comes forth from the grave, he's the living Christ. He's the eternal Christ. He's the one that is with us. But he gives the commission to his disciples that that message of salvation must go forward. I'll just give you the reference and touch on the key thoughts of two very quick thoughts. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, to whom as... Unto a living stone, disallowed indeed by men, but chosen of God and precious. You are, you also as living stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices accepted to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, precious and elect that he that believeth on him should not be confounded. The stone which is the builder's disallowed, the same is made, the head in the cornerstone. So the imagery here is that the stone of Jesus, it says that the believers become lively stones as in a mosaic law, as in a mosaic wall, a building up of the temple, that you are to be a living stone, taking the message of the gospel, founding your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. An awesome, amazing story of four stones. 
One is a stone of comfort and hope of Lazarus. One is a stone of comfort and power over evil. But the stone of being a lively stone is a dynamic living stone that God wants to carry on in our lives. For the gospel moves from him being with us to down through the ages, giving that commission to each generation that lives to take that living hope to others. Aren't you glad that it carries on, friends? Aren't you get glad that you find hope and comfort from association one with another? But we take it one more place, for I find in Rev... <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me, we'll go down deep here. I find it in Revelation chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. One more example of a, an amazing stone. For you see in the end, when Jesus comes again, Revelation talks about a time that we will receive a stone. He that hath ear, in 2.17 says, He that hath ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him, what does the Bible say? A white stone. And in that stone, what is there? A new name, which no man knows, save he that receives it. What an imagery from the gravestone of Lazarus, where he cares about those who are living and makes manifest his power over the grave. To the amazing story of the eternal righteousness with victory over the powers of darkness. To the place where we find that the stones of difficulty can never hold us back, but that Christ is with us to ultimately receiving a stone, a white stone, the Bible calls us, calls it, with a new name. I'm wondering what my new name will be. How about you, friends? I can't wait to find out. It's a stone. It may say Richard. It may say Ricardo. It may say anything. It really doesn't matter to me. I just want to see what's on that stone. Because when I receive it, it will be from the Lord Jesus Christ. He is risen, all-powerful, all-redeeming. There is no darkness. There is no despair that can come to us, but that He doesn't have the power to give us hope and power through the death of His only begotten Son to carry us through to that day when we receive that white stone. I'm looking forward to that day. How about you? Let us pray together. Father, darkness and evil always gives way to holiness and light. Despair and hopelessness always gives way to hope and hopefulness. Loneliness, Father, and struggling and not knowing what the future holds always gives way to your comfort and compassion. We see through the situations in life that bring us into the impossible places we find ourselves. Not through our own strength, not through our knowledge of the Bible, but we see through them, Father, when we look to Jesus, 
when we see through the darkness of the cross, when we go into the darkness of the tomb, when we hear the voice of God saying, come forth, when we see Jesus resurrected, when we look forward to the advent, when we look forward to receiving the stone that contains our new name. So, Father, we, we ask that you would fill us. We ask that you will be with us. We ask that you will guide us until that day when we see you face to face. Live within us and through us, Father, that we can carry this message to a perishing world, we ask in Christ's precious name. Amen.